Hello, everybody. Welcome to Holly Randall Unfiltered and... Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Pornhub podcast. <laughs> you know what I, I feel like? I feel like this is like, you know that um that Spider-Man meme where like all the different Spider-Mans are pointing their fingers at each other and it's like, the meme is basically saying like, you're the same as me. <laughs> That's us right now. <laughs> Well, also, I would be so lucky if I was even close to being anything the same as you. We all know this is not true. You are one of a kind and incomparable. But yeah, so what we're doing essentially is like called a swap cast. Um, I wanted to interview Asa again for my show. She wanted to interview me for the Pornhub podcast. And we were like, why don't we just do a swap cast, which is essentially not me specifically interviewing her or her specifically interviewing me, um, we're just going to kind of have a conversation about our lives and you're going to enjoy it. God damn it. <laughs> it's kind of like how in the porn industry, I think like the closest thing is what we call a content trade. Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. Exactly. Exactly like that. Which is basically when two performers get together, create some content and they both own the rights to it. And that's kind of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then someone else puts it on another platform and then the other person yells at them and then they get in a fight and they don't talk to each other anymore. Exactly. That's totally not so, going to happen. <laughs> it's T minus one year till we're not speaking is basically <laughs> what we're saying. <laughs> so no, that would never happen with us. And of course not. Um, I'm kind of sad because my whole plan was to come out to New York and to record with you live. And also like I was going to record with Danny Daniels and I was going to do some other stuff. And then this goddamn coronavirus hit. So we have to do this remotely now. Yeah. You know, and we had a whole plan. Like, so we, you, I don't remember who reached out to who first. I think maybe it was even something like one of us commented on an Instagram story of the yeah. other person or something. We just got to talking and you told me you were pregnant. Yes. Yeah. This, and this was way before anyone knew. Mm -hmm. This is before I even told like twisties or any of my clients. I know. And you know how I know is because I would say maybe a month or so later, Spiegler was like, Hey, guess who's pregnant? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know who. And he thought he was breaking the news to me because Spiegler usually does break porno gossip. Um, and I was like, actually, I knew that. And then like two weeks after that, Erin was like, guess who's pregnant? And I'm like, hmm, who? <laughs> See, I designate who like is important in the industry depending on like when I tell them I'm pregnant. So clearly you take precedent over that. You know, what's funny is I remember telling Spiegler that I was pregnant and um, he and I knew to myself and I was like, the secret's going to be out now. But this is telling the world. Yes. But to be fair, like I'm really bad at keeping secrets. So the minute I found out, I told um, my like crew and uh, basically any model that I was shooting. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the danger also of having a podcast, which is like it's like, you don't know what you'll reveal to the world. And then it's out there, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, that's true. I mean, one can actually, that's funny that you say that because uh, I do record my podcast live normally when I record them in the studio, right? And I had Ginger Lynn on and Ginger Lynn happened to be staying with my parents. And my mom gave Ginger Lynn a book on like, I think it's called The Whole Nine Months, W-H-O-L-E, about like eating healthy and pregnancy and ginger brought it to the studio and gave it to me and then right before we started the actual podcast and we were live she mentioned something about it and i was like K -k 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 -k. so like my patreon members who get to watch the live version they are all like hmm kind of in on it yeah but not confirmed yeah well, welcome to Porno Milfhood. <laughs> I know. I'm excited. I feel like so many other people are, it's weird. Like everybody's pregnant right now. Really? Well, okay. Uh, I know of one 
porn star who's porn pregnant. Star. Sorry, I should I sh- in my circle of like basically my husband's all of his literally all of his best friends have either just had a child or are having a child in the next few months. And my sister in law is having a baby in like a couple of weeks. Oh, how lucky for your kid. Yeah, it's actually really cool. So like we're all having kids at the same time. But yeah, I know Lena the plug is mm-hmm. she's pregnant. Um I was so. thinking of a different porn star. I knew about Lena, but I was thinking of another porn star actually. Did they announce But it I don't know if open about it. Hmm. We don't we maybe so, we don't want to reveal it just yet. Yeah. We'll we'll tell each other off off camera. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so um, yeah, how, I mean, how do you, how are you feeling? You're in your second trimester. Mm-hmm. I'm like 16 weeks now. Um, I feel really good. It's really strange. I've had an incredibly easy pregnancy. Um, I had no morning sickness at all, ever. Oh my God. I, fucking big. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, have a lot of energy. Um, I mean, I take like, it's funny because I feel like I should take naps because I have the time now. Um, and I used to be a big nap taker. Yeah. But, like I don't really, I don't really feel like I need it. Um, I do go to bed earlier. That's for sure. I, I did just start having heartburn like literally this week, which has never happened to me before. Yeah. So, well, you're actually in like what they kind of called the golden era or whatever of pregnancy where like, they say the second trimester is kind of easy peasy and it's the first and the third that are generally harder for people. Yeah. But you're very lucky. I had like a pretty shit pregnancy. I got carpal tunnel. What? From I know. From like what? It's something to do with how like the there's so much blood pumping through your veins that like the veins get fatter and it blocks a nerve in your wrist. It's like this whole fucking thing. And I had to wear like a brace to sleep. Oh my God. (laughs) It was, and I had no food cravings, which was like the part I was looking forward to the most because I had this like romantic idea in my mind of where like I would send my husband out for pickles and ice cream in the middle of the night. What is it with pickles and ice cream? I was thinking about that the other day. I'm like, not once have I craved pickles or ice cream and definitely not together. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I remember Stormy telling me that she um, was obsessed with the idea of sniffing and eating dirt. And her doctor told her it ended up she needed like more magnesium or something like that. So I don't know, like weird shit does happen. Just it. I was I was not that lucky cravings wise. (laughs) How was the last uh, trimester for you? Was it really hard? shit holly like (laughs) i know my sister-in-law is going through it right now she's like so like it's hard for her to eat because she's so full because the baby is pushing up on your organs and she says she wakes up in the middle of the night and like has to throw up acid from Mm -hmm. like acid reflux it's horrendous like it's so for me i had i think i had an especially bad third trimester like i i was really hungry, but I couldn't eat at all. Like I just Mm -hmm. felt nauseated the instant I ate anything. Um, and I don't know, like another pregnancy fantasy in my mind was like, that's when I'm going to eat every day is a cheat day. Mm -hmm. And I was like that except for the the final trimester when I, I was just like so hungry, but I couldn't eat. And then I don't know. I was just, I was really tired and moody all the time. And I hope that doesn't happen to you. Yeah, I the other thing I've not had is uh pregnancy mood swings at all. Like I've oh had no hormonal mood swings. <laughs> I hate you. It's funny because my mom told me that she had a really easy pregnancy with all three of us. But you know, I heard all these oh. horror stories, so I was really scared, but so far it's been good. I mean, this could all change, you know, like next week I could have it, it could all come crashing down. No, it could be different tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying not to be cocky. I mean, the only great thing right now is my boobs. You're okay. I saw your boobs for like a split second in this video call we're doing right now. They're ginormous. They're so big. They're They're so big. big. You were trying to show me your belly and I was like, holy shit, your boobs. It's obscene. It's awesome. So great. It's so great. It's funny because my husband the other day, he's like, 
well, you were talking about getting fake boobs, but you don't, it looks like you already got, like you got a boob job. Like, there you go. I'm like, yeah, but they're going to deflate and turn into like pancakes. They will, but first they're going to get even bigger. (laughs) (laughs) They get so big, Holly. Like right when you think they can't get any bigger, they get bigger. (laughs) And then they deflate. (laughs) Mine are are pretty deflated. Like I'm pretty sure like I'm headed for another boob job after this. Do you think having the boob job helped you with the deflation though? Um, Like do they look better than you think that they would if you didn't have a boob job? I do think that, but, um, if I were to do it over, I don't know that I would do it in this order. I don't know that I would get a boob job first, then have a baby only because I had so much anxiety about breastfeeding. Mm. Um, I really wanted to breastfeed and like my nipples have been pierced. I've had a boob job. I've had one of my implants fixed. Like I've just done so much crap to my boobs that like the whole pregnancy, I was like, Oh my God, I'm not going to be able to breastfeed. Um, which is fine, actually. Now that I have a baby, I'm like, oh my God, like, what was I even anxious about? But, um, yeah, like that, cause, cause they say like, you don't know until you're doing it if you can or cannot. Um, yeah. Cause I guess some people don't produce enough milk and then some people uh-huh. produce so much milk. They like have to sell it. Adriana Chechik yes! will buy your breast milk. That's what I heard. <laughs> Adriana <laughs> I will sell you my breast milk. I will sell it to you for, no, I won't give you a discount because you're right. You have a really great rate. I know what you charge. I will charge full price for my breast milk. But yes, Adriana, you can have my breast milk. Isn't it also like so on brand for Adriana Chechik to be trying to buy black market breast milk? (laughs) And I mean that like not even in a bad way. It's just like, of course you are. Of course. Oh my God. That's so funny. Um, <laughs> what does she use it for though? It's supposed to be like great for your skin or something, right? It's good for your skin, and I think she said eczema or something, but it, it's good for like all skin conditions. And I will say this, like I ended up putting it in my kid's bath, like when he had eczema or when he had diaper rash and it really, really worked. So it is, it is like pretty magical stuff. So I, you- I put it in my husband's eye when he had pink eye. Fuck off. You were just like. (laughs) Literally, I was like squirting it in his eye and also like onto his finger. And then he'd be like dabbing it into his eyeball. But um, I hope you recorded that. Like, yeah, I know I should have. Right. But like, I I think it's hard to tell with pink eye, like if it was going to get better anyway. So I don't know if my breast milk did anything. But what I can report is that the pink eye did eventually go away. (laughs) So. Take, take what you will from that. Here we are spending all this money, you know, paying big pharma, all this money for these Mm -hmm. drugs with all these side effects. And all we ever needed was breast milk. It's true. It's true. It's the cure all. Maybe, maybe that's the Corona cure. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) We found it. guys. So what have you been doing during this quarantine? Cause you're over there on the East coast and you guys are Mm -hmm. pretty locked down over there. I mean, we-, we are pretty locked down. I haven't left to the front of my house in almost two months now. I think it's been like 52 days for me. Um, but I don't know for me, like my schedule itself, like isn't so different except for the fact that I'm not traveling, but because so much of my work is from home, especially like the stuff I do for my Pornhub page. And then also as Pornhub's brand ambassador, like a lot of that can be done remotely. So my days are kind of like, I'm just like still working at home. Mm-hmm. Um, how about you? Like your, your schedule must be so drastically shifted because mm-hmm. you're used to being on set all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously haven't been shooting, so that's been different. I won't lie. It's been kind of nice. Mm-hmm. And I know Honestly, my greatest fear about this quarantine is that it's going to make me lazy and it's going to make me not want to go back to set because especially now that I'm pregnant and I get tired earlier, you know, these ideas, this idea of having these, you know, 18 hour days on set is even less, yeah, is even less, um, 
you know, less enticing. I, I will say that it really depends on the client. Like for twisties, my days are generally about 10 hours, which is really nice. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's totally manageable. Um, but I'm sure as you recall, shooting feature movies for Wicked, that's an entirely different story. Yeah. And oh, yeah. so I don't know if I will go back to doing that once this happened, this goes away. This is something like, I'm so glad you said that because I've been wondering it a lot is, so I've been working from home for a while now. It's been a few years. Um, the last time I had like a real job was at Barstool Sports where like I went into an office nine to five and like every day I was there, I was like, I can't, I can't believe I have to work. I have, I can't believe I have to go to work. Like I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't get into it. Um, and then before that, you know, like I was with Wicked and like, I only shot one movie a month. So like I've, other than the barstool thing, like I've been pretty accustomed to like this being on my own schedule kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think because of that, like, I think that's why for me, like having a nine to five at barstool was so hard. Like I, I think it was, it's kind of like, you can't teach an old dog new tricks kind of thing. And I, but I do wonder if that's, what's going to happen to the rest of the world. Like People are used to working from home now. I mean, or they're going to be like, I wonder, yeah, yeah, they're not going to want to come back though. I have to say, um, my assistant did talk to me the other day and she was like, I really want to come back into the office. She's like, I'm so sick of working from home and I can't concentrate and I get really distracted. So I was like, so wow, you really, cause I was thinking that she was going to be like, you know, I really like this working from home kind of thing. I don't really want to come in anymore. But no, it's not the case. Huh. Then so maybe like some people, maybe it's just like the way, maybe, maybe it's, it's like a innate thing. Like some people like it and some Yeah, I think are- it depends. And it also, I think, depends on your ability to self-motivate. I think some people mm-hmm. are really bad at setting their own schedule and self-motivating. Mm-hmm. It's so easy to get distracted from home. I mean, a lot of times what I would do is if I had to really buckle down and do something like write a script or something, I go to like a coffee shop or I go like to a restaurant to do that because just being at home, I find like the dogs need some attention. I got to finish laundry, like always find something to distract me. Yeah. Okay. I'm not like that. No. I'm like, I close my office door and I'm like, don't come in here. (laughs) So I don't know, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm used to it, but yeah. So you're like a good self-motivator worker from home. I think just some people are work really well like that. And other people need like that office interaction. They need feedback off other people. I mean, would you call yourself more of an introvert? Yes, Mm. for sure. Yeah. What about you? You're a, wait, let me try to guess. Are you, I think, I think you're secretly an extrovert? Yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, I, I like spending time alone when I was a kid, I was really shy and, um, I spent a lot of time alone, but I do enjoy being on set with other people. I do feed off other people. I mean, obviously I like people, you know, like I have this fucking show where like I talk to people for like an hour. Yeah. So clearly I like people. So yeah, I don't know. It's like a strange combo. I think, I think I think I'm like a little bit of both. I mean, I guess everyone's a little bit of both. I like one thing I've really learned during, you know, this whole quarantine thing is like, I am an introvert and I do really love to be alone, but like, it really has to be on my own terms. And obviously right now it's not. And yeah. like the fact that I cannot socialize is like, it's pretty horrible. Like, yeah. Yeah. So you're in quarantine, like the rest of us, but you, there's something a little different with you. You have a kid. How is it with the kid? Because is he like toddler age now? He's a total toddler now. Like he's um, about to be one and a half. So he's like, he's walking. He's like kind of talking. He's real. he's never like not moving. Um... But I'm also really lucky because Sean also works from home. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it, it's been, it, it hasn't been as bad as like 
Like I look at my friends with like five and six year olds mm. and I'm like, damn, that sucks. Yeah. Um, cause you know, at that age, like at that age and up, I think kids really want to be outside. They want to see their friends. They, they don't understand why they're not being social. And whereas like my kid is kind of like, his world has not really changed. He doesn't go to music class anymore. And that's about it. Mm -hmm. Um, I seriously doubt he even notices. So yeah, he won't remember this. Yeah. He's going to be like, I I think about this all the time, but like, I think he's like, I think about how he's going to talk about this and he'll probably be like, yeah, I don't really remember it. I was a baby. (laughs) I know. Right. (laughs) He'll be like that that kind of, I don't know. I don't know. But like, when do you think, when is this going to be done? Like, I don't know. Um, I heard that our mayor is going to come out. Oh no, our governor, sorry. Um, is going to come out with some information today about when we can start, uh, going back to work. So I don't know. I honestly, like, I really try before I like needed to know we were going to go back to work, but now that I've kind of settled into this routine where I'm kind of enjoying like not Mm -hmm. shooting and like just doing podcasts and and working on other stuff and, um, you know, just like kind of being at home and going on bike rides and like picking flowers from my garden. Mm -hmm. I don't really think that much about it. I'm just like, cause I I can't change anything. Right. So I try not to stress Mm -hmm. about it. And so I'm just like, whenever it happens, it happens. I'm in a pretty good situation. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm super lucky. So I think there's a lot of other people who, you know, are not in such a fortunate situation. So I feel really blessed, Mm -hmm. but I'm not, yeah, I don't know. I I, I honestly don't, I try not to think about it basically. How do you think, uh, I'm like, you're like telling me you're trying not to think about it. I'm like, well, how, how do you, but I do want to know, like, how do you think this will change our industry? So there's been some talk and I was thinking about this before this press release came out. And obviously everybody else was as well about adding COVID-19 testing to the panel of tests already and putting it in mm-hmm. pass so that when you go get checked for your STDs, you also get tested for COVID-19. Um, totally. But then it was funny. And then there was a, like a follow-up release where the FSC was like, well, we're not going to do that because you could contract the disease in the, t- in the two week testing period between tests. So it's just not safe enough. And I was like, um, okay, but that's I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was like, Any but disease. that's the case for all of yeah. the things that you're being tested for. Though to hmm. be fair, obviously COVID nineteen is way more infectious. Right, um, you're not going to pick up gonorrhea at the grocery store unless you know you're fucking banging everybody in the grocery store. And I don't know how you roll. You know, like maybe that's your thing. No judgment. No judgment. No judgment. But so obviously it's a lot more infectious. But I also think too, like I was talking to some other porn stars about this, and they were like, "Look, you know." If I'm willing to risk the chance of getting HIV, which is, you know, an uncurable and potentially deadly disease, then I feel safe willing to risk getting COVID-19, which is unlikely, and I know it happens, but it's unlikely to kill a young, healthy person. But it's also a totally different thing because like, let's say I contract HIV, right? Right. It's not like if I go to my parents' house, yeah, they might they might get it just by breathing the same or yeah. you know air as me. Totally. Yeah, the contagion is way different. So, yeah. But I think that eventually we're going to have you know, those people who are working are maybe going to have to be smart and understand that they can't go see their elderly parents while they're working right. and they might have to self-quarantine for 2 weeks before they do that and adjust, you know. I mean, they're going to have to make their own personal decisions to try to make sure that they're being as safe as possible, Mm -hmm. but that's, you know, at their discretion. I don't know. That's that's everyone. I mean, like literally you could say the same thing about an accountant's office. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, this disease is not like 
specific to sex workers in any way. Like it's not even sexually transmitted actually. Right. But obviously kissing somebody, you're way more likely to transmit it than like breathing on somebody in the grocery store. Right. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's no easy answer. Um, I think that if the people that want to go back to work, if, you know, we take certain precautions, maybe the crew and, um, you know, we all wear masks and gloves Mm -hmm. and everybody gets tested. But then I also hear that the tests aren't really reliable yet and they're definitely not widely available. So I don't know. Yeah, that's actually one thing I was wondering when I saw that press release is like that because so I think talent testing did officially add COVID-19 to the test, right? To the panel. Like, are there that many tests available? I don't know. And I'm not sure if they officially did. I think they were talking about oh, okay. it. But I don't know if they did it. I could be totally wrong. I could be wrong too. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's great that we're talking about <laughs> things that we know so well. That we, we really know the facts about this stuff and we're spreading it's information. It's the nature of like just what it is to be in a global pandemic in the yeah. age of what, social media, the internet, when everyone has access to information, but everyone also has access to all this like wrong information, right? Like it's, yeah, that, I think that's a huge problem. I mean, the misinformation that's being spread on online is, is, is terrible. And, you know, people are in a panic, understandably so, but there's new data coming out that show that is showing it's, it's definitely not nearly as deadly as we've been, the media has been showing it to be. And Mm -hmm. it may not be as infectious as the meat, as we've been, Mm-hmm. I mean, how do you know? You know what I mean? It's like it was this this new disease that hit us, and I'm definitely not a scientist or a doctor. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, obviously, it takes time to learn and understand these diseases. So, you know, one should be an abundance of caution is probably the the safest thing to go with. Mm-hmm. It'll be really interesting, I think, to look at all of this from a perspective of like ten years or five years. You know, like. In hindsight, it'll be really interesting to see how people look at the way society reacted to this. Also, like, there is no way we're coming out of this as a people, like, of Earth, I mean, Mm -hmm. as, like, we're going to be so different after this. Yeah. Like, I think, I I mean, not, besides the obvious of, like, we're all going to be wearing masks and, like, you know, we're going to be perhaps more germaphobic or whatever but like I just think like you know how like you know how like the the generation of people who've been through war Mm. are like they're they're a little bit more hoardy you know what I mean and like they're a little bit more um they're a little bit more like just like little things like they save their food and like, you know, like little things like that. I think there's going to be so much shit that's specific to our generation now. That's just like, Oh yeah. Like the, you know, you know them, like they went through the, they went through COVID-19. Like, yeah. you know how they are. Yeah. That's why they're so they won't shake your hand or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's funny too, because a lot of people are like, I'm like, what is the first thing that you're going to do? when quarantine ends, they're like, I'm going to hug everybody I see. I'm like, are you? Nah. <laughs> I mean, are you? Because I feel like a lot of people are not going to be okay with that. Yeah, no. I mean, I can tell you right now, the first thing I'm doing is calling my cleaning lady. Because <laughs> <laughs> I am really over this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, actually, one thing I wanted to ask you, because you kind of touched on it for a second, was like, you were talking about like the crew of porn and stuff. And obviously like you and I are so, so, so incredibly lucky to be able to survive this right now. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, mm-hmm. and we're lucky enough to be able to say things like, like, Oh, we're okay right now. Like, you know, whatever. But, um, so many people that work in porn, especially the BTS people, right? Like, um, the guy, the people who are behind the camera are like, completely out of work. They, it's not like they can cam or do only fans or whatever. So like, is there, and, and I know that the free speech coalition has a fund for it to help them with their bills and stuff. Like, is there, have you, do you know of anything else? Like, is there anything else we can be doing 
to like. Well, it's funny that you should ask that because Browsers has a relief fund for crew members and they sent me a bunch of money to give to my crew members. So yeah, yeah. amazing. Um, And as much slack as I think MindGeek gets for like a lot of things, like I can personally attest to the fact that like they're really fucking incredible to their employees. Yeah, I will. I will definitely. Yeah, it's funny because you know I'm on the Pornhub podcast, and <laughs> because I've had to interview so many different people in the industry, and not everybody's a huge fan of Pornhub. I've actually mm-hmm. found myself defending <laughs> Pornhub and MindGeek quite a few times. And look, I understand like the things that people have against the company. I totally get it. Mm-hmm. But speaking from a personal perspective, and I always say this, I'm like, look, this is just from a personal perspective. Um, I've worked for MindGeek for like over a decade and they've always been really, really good to me. Mm-hmm. And when I was pregnant and I, I talked to you, I had to, you remember I told you, I was like, I haven't told Twisties yet. I'm kind of nervous. And I think one of these things that women fear so much about getting pregnant and going on maternity leave is that like we lose our edge, you know, in the business world because we work so hard to get ahead and women generally have to work so much harder than men to get any kind of advancement and any kind of like CEO or leadership role. And then, you know, it feels like having a baby just like puts you all these steps back and then you have to stop working for a while, but like people still have to pay you. And, Mm -hmm. um, you just just feel like a huge burden. A huge burden, right? And then, like, people are going to forget about you. Not pregnant person is going to swoop in and take my job because why wouldn't they? Exactly. So I was nervous about telling Twisties because, you know, I am freelance. I'm not under contract. They do not Mm -hmm. have to give me any work at all if they don't want to. Um, But they were really kind about it. Uh, And they said, you know, whatever you need, we'll accommodate you if you, like, want to direct from home on Skype or something. (laughs) <laughs> like, you know, cause my, my crew has worked for me for like 10 years or so, most of them. So they kind of know what I need. So I could probably yeah. go to set, maybe set things up and then like kind of check in throughout the day. I don't know. We'll see. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to know, but anyways, but getting back awesome to that, like you can even be thinking about that. Like that's really yeah. cool for you. Yeah. Yeah. And that they were, you know, really so like just excited for me and, you know, whatever we can do to help, um, was re- I really appreciated it, but, but yeah, getting back to your original question, um, I've been talking to, I mean, like my makeup artist, Rosalinda, I talked to her and, you know, she fortunately was a very smart woman and she's like, my mother always raised me to have at least six months worth of, money saved up to cover all my basic needs. She's like, mm-hmm. so I'm actually like set for six months. And I was like, fuck mm-hmm. dude, I'm not set for six months. Like mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you're so smart. And then everybody else is, um, you know, filing unemployment or if they're freelance, I mean, that's a whole, ma- I honestly, I guess my answer is I don't fucking know. Like I yeah. really don't understand Same. how people that's are doing right now. Yeah. It's, it's really, it sucks. I mean, I think about that and like, I do feel like performers are in such a fortunate position where like we have the option to cam, we have the option to, you know, work from home. But I think of all these people who like, you know, they got up to where we are in our career. They're just as crucial to our careers as we ourselves are, you know? So it's, it's fucking crazy but but so in that sense like I can completely understand why people are very eager to get back to work you know what I mean totally like it's it's, I don't I don't think I think there's like a lot of weirdly a lot of shame right now around like people who are like wanting to work oh my god I don't know that out there but like dude the shame the social media shaming is at an all-time high and I get really angry about it And, um, I actually got in an argument with somebody on Twitter about it. And then I was like, that's when I was like, you know what? I just need to like, not, I just need to mind my own business. Like I normally do. I normally do not get involved in any kind of Twitter disputes, but, um, yeah, I'm just like, you know, people like telling on other people and just like, don't go outside. And I heard this person's doing that. And it's like, I understand 
like I understand that as adult performers, what other people do with their bodies directly affects your own health, right? Because if somebody's mm -hmm. not concerned about being healthy, then, you know, working with them can work against you. Mm -hmm. But I also just feel like the way that people are just going online and just like pointing fingers is, is also really frustrating. But I think, you know, people are, are scared and, um, they have nothing better to do. Yeah. It's the, it's that, it's exactly that equation. I think yeah. it's like boredom plus <laughs> anxiety. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also like, but you're right. Like also like shaming is like, at the end of the day, it's like not even constructive. <laughs> no, not at all. It doesn't all. work. <laughs> no, and it, it doesn't. And you know, I mean, I don't know. It helps. I, I, it's interesting to see like people's true natures come out, I think. Mm -hmm, for sure. But yeah, oh, definitely. It's, you know, people behave badly in bad situations. So mm -hmm. yeah. Have you like picked up any hobbies or anything during this whole thing? I tried baking a cake and it was, came out terrible. <laughs> I don't know why I'm not surprised. No offense. I, I don't know why you just like strike me as someone who is not a baker. It's not like, is not a baker. I don't no know. Directions. <laughs> I don't know. I just like, imagine, I, I can envision you just like yelling at an oven and like, <laughs> Why won't you work? Yeah. <laughs> um, I did also start like a little vegetable garden only because my husband started one and he was like really obsessed with me starting one too. I think secretly he wants to compete with me and see who can buy, who can grow better vegetables. Wait, and, that's kind of adorable. And he's, he's, he's very competitive. And to be honest, he is 100% winning right now because like my vegetables are not doing that well. And I just... I don't really care that much, but like, he really wants me to care about these vegetables. And I just, I don't know. I just don't really care that much. How are you guys doing? Like, aside from this, like playful competitiveness, like, cause you guys are actually not a couple that's used to like being together 24 seven, right? Like because of your jobs right, and stuff, right. like, are you okay? <laughs> Blink once if you're not okay. <laughs> 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 um, we're actually doing really, really well. This has um, been, I think, a great reassurance to me that we really are as compatible as I thought we would be. Um, he actually left. So he got laid off from the firm that he was at like uh, this fall or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was like September. Um, and then he's, and it was a firm that he worked out in LA. So he would actually go to an office. So he's at this new firm, which is in another state. So he works remotely. So he's actually been working from home since the- Oh, okay. So, and you know, I work from home too, but luckily like I have a two story house, his, his office is upstairs. Like I don't really see him all day. Like he's in there all day and then I'm downstairs in my office, but you know, like I would go to shoots, obviously he would go play hockey every single day. And, um, a couple nights a week he would be gone like until 10 o'clock at night playing hockey. So like I would get those moments to watch, like, you know, stay at home and watch like, little, little women or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, he doesn't want to see. So, um, but it's been good. He's been, I mean, you know, we get on each other's nerves from time to time and he, he's, he admitted to me that he's been a little bit depressed lately. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, honestly, like his, Aren't if this him depressed, like I'll take it, you know? Yeah. So I think, yeah, for sure. And like staying home is depressing. Yeah. It can be, it really, really can be like, usually I make a, like, even when I'm working at home regularly, like I definitely usually try to take note to like, at least go for a walk if I haven't been outside that day. And yeah. you know, now you can go for a walk, but it's like, it's not like you can go anywhere, you know? Well, I feel pretty fortunate because you know, I have a yard and so I can go out in the yard and, you know, we can walk around. So, mm -hmm. so that's been nice, but yeah, I definitely miss like hiking and stuff like that. So, okay. So we're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back. And, um, I promise people will come back and we'll actually start talking about porn more and <laughs> less about children and quarantine. Sexy talk is coming your way. 
If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. So you are the brand ambassador for one of the biggest brands in the world. Is it (laughs) true that Pornhub really is like the number three most trafficked website in the world, like under Amazon and Google? You know, I should know that. Um, I don't know. I, I have heard stuff like that. I don't, I don't know. But like, I mean, I'm sure that information is out there. Like you just go to like Alexa or something. Right. Yeah. But, um, I, I, I actually don't know. I would <laughs> say it's in the, it's definitely in the top 10. I think so. Probably like for sure, which is crazy. Do you know how many hits they get like a day? I, um, the last I checked, I think it was 75 million hits a day. Um, but you know, it's interesting that you should say that. Cause I, I always think of Pornhub and mind geek as like, Oh, you know, like one of the biggest brands in porn, um, certainly mind geek, but like, I guess I never really thought of it as like one of the biggest brands in the world because I mean, I feel like society just doesn't allow us to think of it that way. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, I was reading like a random, I think it was a Joe Nesbo book and Pornhub came up. You know, and I was, and this is like this crime writer from like Scandinavia. Right. Someone's going to correct me that he's from some other country in that area. What yeah. Else? Some part of Europe, some, some place that doesn't speak English. <laughs> and I was yeah, like, but- wow, you know, but it does have that kind of reach. Yeah, no, for sure. Like I, I'm constantly coming across Pornhub in just mainstream media and like, I'll be like, oh, I wonder how much they paid for that plug. And I'll ask and they'll be like, like, no, no, no. Like we didn't pay for that first of all. And second of all, we don't even want it because it'll be like something not even that great. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Um, You know, but like, it's, it's, it's shockingly like a really intimate team. Mm -hmm. Um, it is like a really big company, as you know. Mind Geek is huge. Have you been out to their Montreal offices? Yep. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to me that they'd like. I don't know. There's what twelve floors or something in the building, and like people don't something like that. No I think they're in the like you get in an elevator with a bunch of people, and no one in that elevator knows each other. They all work. No one. Me. It, it's so crazy, and like. Every time I go there, I meet so many people in the building who are like, "I've never met a porn star," and I'm like, "What?" Like you guys run Pornhub and Brazzers and Twisties and men.com. Like it's so crazy to me, but yeah, it's, it's very much, it's very, very corporate out there. Um, but the Pornhub team is like super intimate and awesome and really creative. And I'm in my third year working for them and it's, it's just been like really awesome. Actually, I have to say. How did, how did that whole relationship start? Like, what was the conversation where they made you brand ambassador? Like, and what were they looking for? Did they tell you why they wanted to work with you? Like, why are you so special, Asa? <laughs> I, so it actually stemmed from, um, I, I think the first conversation actually happened when, as I was, 
I hadn't left Barstool yet, but so I worked for this company called Barstool Sports for like a year, which is, um, it, it's there. They started out as a sports blog and now they're just pretty much like this huge media company. Um, and I did a podcast with them. Um, it was and then, called, I'm curious about, right? Um, no, no, no. So before that one, I joined a pre existing show on their network called KFC Radio. Oh, which okay. Is like the second biggest show in the whole network. Um, and it, it kind of like, it started off great. And then eventually like they had to take me off the show. Cause like they couldn't get a lot of advertisers were like opting out once I was on the show. Oh my God. Um, yeah. And then like, and then that turned into like, oh, we're doing this spot for ESPN. So everyone in the company has to be involved except for you. And there was just so many things like that. And it how like, that, by the end, how did that it, it felt cool. really shitty. Hmm? I was no, yeah, I was gonna ask, like, how did that make you feel? It was horrible. Like it, you know, like I'm definitely someone who really like I get a lot of like gratification out of doing a good job. Like that's just I'm like such a sub that way. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And so like for me to like be at a job where it just felt like I was doing a horrible job every single day, like just by being who you are. Yeah. And originally that's what they hired me for. And like, I'm not even blaming them really. Like I, I'm so thankful to them for even like giving the whole thing a shot, you know? Um, and they hired me as like the resident porn star, I guess. And it just didn't work out with the advertisers and with all the other companies that they're working with. Um, and so that was like starting to feel really sh- shitty. Um, so for me, like when that started going shitty, I was like, shit, I need to like find something new, something I'm good at. Um, by then I was already living part-time in New York. I was already dating Sean. Um, I was already like in the middle of my divorce from Tony Rebus. And I completely forgot well, you guys were together until you brought that I, up. I totally <laughs> forgot. I know. What was it like being married to him? Oh my God. I mean, I love Tony, but that man is so much energy. He has so much energy, but let me tell you something. He's nothing like that at home. Okay. He's, that makes sense. I think, spends, I think he spends all of his energy around. He's like an extrovert in that way. Like, I think he really yeah. is so energetic in a group of people, but at home he was so like chill, just smoking weed, playing video games, like not that energetic guy at all. Mm. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so like, I, I think I, I approached Pornhub initially and was like, Hey, like, are you guys like looking t- for anyone to do anything? <laughs> and they were like, well, actually we are, we have been like trying to fill this like brand ambassador role and blah, blah. And from there, like, we just kind of had all these like organic conversations over the course of like months really. Um, and then, yeah, like, so even when I started my deal with them, it was not like, I wouldn't say it was crystal clear what I would be doing. Mm -hmm. I I knew I'd be doing the podcast for them. Um, and then other than that, like even now my contract is very vague. Like it, it doesn't, it's not like I have to like, like produce an X amount of stuff for them. I'm really Mm -hmm. just like, there when they need you. Well, that was kind yeah. of I, when they were really starting to shift towards marketing, right? Because before they really were just this big tube site that mm-hmm. made a fuck ton of money and a lot of people hated. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they were, and then they really like turned the mark with marketing, and they started doing all of these these things that that got their name out there in the mainstream media in a totally different way, these, you know, like charitable things. And, um, it's actually been really impressive to, to watch. And I would imagine you kind of were on the cusp of that, right? Um, yeah. Like I think I came on around then and their marketing team is like so fucking genius. Like Mm -hmm. I'm so, so, so inspired by Pornhub's marketing team. And it's, it's also like, I am, they do so much stuff that I'm, I actually like am very, very proud to be affiliated and associated with them and to work mm-hmm. for them. Cause, cause it's like you said, like they really do, not only do they do a lot of charitable shit and I don't want to even like sound like I'm like, <laughs> like all hail Pornhub or, yeah. you know, like I'm 
drinking the Kool-Aid, but like, it's not only do they do all this like charitable stuff all the time, but they're also so ethical, like, and, and down to like everything. Like, even if we shoot a promo, they always make sure like half the people are people of color, you know? And like Mm. in porn, that's pretty unheard of, right? Like we, we're very, very still behind as an industry, I think when it comes to matters of like race, right? Oh, racism. Um, Racism is like our number one marketing tool. Yeah. It's true. Like, it's it's so racist. racist that it comes out the trend. Yeah. Because we're all search terms. And like, I think there is, there is something to be argued for the fact that we need that a little bit. Like, so it's, it's this like weird thing, but, but Pornhub is always like really, really, really conscious of um, stuff like that. They're always like trying to work with women um, you know, when it would be so easy to just like give the gig to some dude that has done this a hundred times, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, so I, I am like really proud to be with them in that way. And, and, you know, this, I, I love podcasting. Like I've, this is the third or fourth podcast I've done. Like I did the one at Barstool. I did one called DVD ASA like a hundred years ago. And like, so I'm really also like thankful to have this like platform where I, I can do podcasting and they give me a lot of control over it. Um, and it's, it, I, I feel like I'm finally like doing the podcast that like I want to do, you know what I mean? Um, so it's, it's been and, awesome. I mean, you, you know, you do a podcast too. Like you do, do I, <laughs> yeah, do I, <laughs> what could you be possibly be talking about? Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to say also too, just, I mean, before we start talking about my podcast, <laughs> fine, I do want to say the one thing about yours is that, I mean, you know, not only do you obviously interview some of the top names in porn, but you've also interviewed people who don't work in porn at all. Like, I think I, I told you that my favorite interview that you did that I was, I found absolutely riveting was with that guy whose name just slipped my mind. Double dick dude? What? No. No. <laughs> He's like this. He's a poet. Oh, humble the poet. Yay. <laughs> you know, same thing. I was like that really inspirational guy. You're like double dick dude. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. My, that that's what you might be talking about, about double dick dude. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no yeah that guy's amazing humble the poet is like uh amazing we actually share a book agent oh okay yeah so yeah but that's what i mean like even you know stuff like that like they've really allowed me Pornhub has really allowed me to like interview whoever i want and it doesn't necessarily have to be porn related Obviously, I always try to incorporate sex into the conversation because that's to me just like the most interesting thing in the world. Like I mm-hmm. could talk and that's about what your sex audience around. expects. Like if you get mm-hmm. somebody on and start talking about like nuclear physics, people are probably not going to be all that excited to uh, right. to listen to that episode. Yeah. But how did how did you start your show? Like so you you've been in the business how long? Um. 20 it'll be 22 years in september oh my god no and actually i wanted to ask you like so you you come from porn royalty um i mean like that's sure. fair to say okay uh, yeah. is suze randall who is perhaps one of the most famous um female photographers in erotica ever right um, it's funny. I mean, yes, I'd like to believe that. And you say that, and I do believe that's true, but I will say that it like, it's sad because nowadays the younger generation, like nobody's any idea who she is. You think? I know. Like, you don't so think many- your mom's like, on par with like Hugh Hefner? Oh no, not at all. No, there's so many people I've worked with who like had no idea who she was. Really? Oh, all the time. That's really surprising to me. Yeah. But like you grew up kind of around the porn industry. Yes. I mean, you've never known different, right? No. <laughs> how, how, so you must have grown up like so differently than the rest of us. Was porn always like it for you? Like, was that always what it was going to be? No, not at all. So I had a really normal childhood. 
Um, my parents, my parents are this really interesting mix of like kind of swinger, like free love party at the Playboy Mansion, um, pornographers, but also like from like a middle class English background. So they're really into like table manners and, you know, I rode horses and like education and, you know, manners and all of those things. So, so even though I knew that my parents worked in the industry, porn was never anything that we really ever talked about or was like part of the family dynamic when I was very young, you know, right? like it just wasn't, I think also too, because my parents weren't like really shameful about it weren't trying to like hide it from me and being like, you know, I can't tell you what mommy and daddy do for a living. And obviously they didn't explain it to me in like vivid detail, but basically what I knew is that my parents made like movies and pictures for grownups and it was for grownups and you know, and how how you young know, were you when you knew that your parents made movies for grownups? I don't know. I've always known because that's the thing. Like okay. they never like hid it for me. They never tried to pretend like they did something else. So I think right. like from a young age, if it ever came up, it was like, yeah, mommy and daddy, like we take pictures for grownups. And I was like, okay, pictures for grownups. Like I don't. Know how old were you when you like explicitly knew that? Like like really knew, or was it so gradual? I think it was just so gradual. Like, I don't remember like a specific moment where I was like, oh, that's what that means. You know what I mean? I just kind of like, like I said, like they, they never hit it. You know, models would come stay with us. Like Tracy Lords would come what? over. Yeah. She came to like my, oh my, my birthday party when I turned five what? and like, yeah, so, you know, like playmates. And I, I don't know, like my parents hang out with Timothy Leary. Like my parents hang out with like, Robert Maplethorpe, like crazy people. And I so, never knew you, any different. So right. I'm so jealous of that. Do you feel, I mean, to me, that sounds great. Do you feel like it was great? I don't remember ever. I don't know. They were just like my parents' friends. Like who cares? I guess that's an impossible You're a kid. One. Like you don't know who Tracy yeah. was. Why would I give a fuck? Like she gave me like a ballerina costume. That's cool. You know, thanks. <laughs> but like, otherwise I don't care about you. You know, is that something you think you'll like pass on to your own kid? Like that attitude toward your job and porn in general? I think so. I hope so. I mean, I feel like my parents did it right. You know, I, I, none of, we did not grow up with a sense of shame around sex. And yes, I work in the adult industry, but my brother is a lawyer and my sister is a nurse. So like we didn't all end up in this and they're very normal people, um, with normal lives and normal jobs. Mm-hmm. We as a family, we get along really, really well. Um, we never fight. We have great Christmases and, you know, we, we love each other and we try to treat other people with respect. And, you know, there's this really wonderful, I'll send you the link if you remind me when we finish, but there's this great um, moment when my mom, so right before I was born, my mom wrote this memoir called Sue's. Actually, technically, my dad wrote it. And it's like this like juicy tell all about like her time as a model turned, you know, uh, erotic photographer. And she was really the only one that was a female at the time. Like there was uh-huh. no women working behind the scenes. Uh-huh. She was very much alone in that. So, you know, it was a great story to tell. And, um, so she wrote this very salacious book about like, you know, times at the grotto and like banging Hugh Hefner and like all that kind of. Your mom banged Hugh Hefner? My mom banged everybody. I know. Wait, you can cut, totally cut this part out if I can't say this like publicly on a podcast, okay. but my favorite thing about your mom is that she fucked Mr. Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. See, hold on. That makes a lot of sense. Cause I actually didn't know that. Oh, wait, hold on. Maybe it's wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> he, okay. So my mom has always been really gooey around Mr. Marcus. Like, <laughs> and he's always flirted with her and it's like kind of gross to me. And I actually saw him at Jim South's 80th birthday, like last, last, <laughs> like, I don't know, a few months ago. And he did the same thing. And my mom was like, hey, Mr. Marcus. And I was like, oh, my God. And she like didn't also didn't know about the whole syphilis thing and him getting kicked out of the industry and all. No, no, no. But I'm talking about like way before, like yeah, but yeah. So that doesn't surprise me in the least, and it doesn't bother me either. 
But also it could be so wrong. Like I've never even met your mom, just so you know. Like I like to me, gonna, your mom. You know what? I'm like, gonna ask her. Yeah, I, yeah, find yeah. out. I'm gonna ask her this week. I'm gonna ask her. Because my mom loves black guys. Like <laughs> loves, 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 loves black guys. She also fucked Bill Cosby willingly. What? I swear to God. Uh, Jim Brown, who was a huge football player back like in the seventies and eighties. Um, but yeah, no, she, she, she's a huge fan of BBC. See, but that's, I, I'm so envious that you are able to say things like this about your mom and it's hilarious. It feels healthy. Yeah. And like, it's, you know what I mean? You're like, oh, that's gross. But you're like laughing. You know what I mean? It's, and to me, it's more funny than gross. It's more funny right. than gross. It's just like, it's just my mom. Like, I don't know. It's just what she's like. I, and- I mean, I can't, like when I think about my mom fucking my dad, I'm like, I can't, my, I, my mind does not even allow myself to go there because I grew up with so much shame around sex, mm-hmm. specifically coming from my parents. So I'm like so envious of that relationship that you have. And it's, that's definitely the kind of thing like I want to pass on to my kid. Like, yeah, I, I want to have that relationship with him where like sex is not this disgusting, gross thing. Like it's, it's beautiful and it's normal. I, I think that's the number one message I would like to relay is that it's yeah. normal. 